Hello, welcome to this week's theology study. We're talking, we're continuing to talk about election. And um, today I want to talk about the fact that election precedes faith. That you were chosen by God before you believed. Faith does not precede election. And, and what we learn from that is that scripture never speaks of our faith as the reason God chose us. I understand that we are saved by faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. Yet we, um, when we consider the doctrine of election, when we consider election in the scriptures, there's no indication that God chose us because of our faith. And I think that's an important thing because once again, we have to fall on our faces and, and cry holy uh, to the Lord because it's something he did when we were unable to believe. And some people would say, well, he knew we would. Um, we'll discuss that later, but that really, that, that argument isn't, isn't substantial when we look at the doctrine of election because we already established that foreknowledge isn't about what God knew we would do, but about his knowledge of us as an individual. And, and so that's in previous videos. Now, if we look at, uh, we can see this. Paul seems to purposefully exclude the consideration of what people would do in life from his discussion of God's choice of Jacob over Esau. And, and, and so he doesn't put that in there at all. And if we were looking at Romans chapter 9, we look at verses 11 through 13, we see it says this. Before the children had been born or had done anything good or bad, Rebecca was told that the older child would serve the younger one. This was said to Rebekah so that God's plan would remain a matter of his choice, a choice based on God's call and not anything people do. The scriptures say, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. So clearly, we can see here that nothing either child would do influenced God's decision. And remember, the future is just like the past to God. He sees it all. And, and, and that includes faith. It was simply so that God's purpose of election might continue. Notice this is more about God than it is about us. And I should hope that we would be okay with that. Now, if we go on, we begin to realize that we're actually chosen by grace. In Romans chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, we can read this. It says, so there were then, there, so as there were then, there are now a few left that God has chosen by his kindness. If they were chosen by God's kindness, they weren't chosen because of anything they did. Otherwise, God's kindness wouldn't be kindness. And, and we want to start by looking at this phrase, chosen by God's kindness. And the word chosen is eklage, which is the word for elect. He elected us or chose us. It connects to that whole discussion of the elect and predestination. And the word for kindness is the Greek word charis, which is the word most often translated for grace. In fact, in many translations, every time you see the word grace, you can look at it and it's going to say charis in the original language, which means favor or kindness. And um, so when we talk about saving grace, it uses the word charis, the kindness of the Lord. Um, and, and so, here we come to understand that God's amazing grace in our lives begin with his choosing or his election of us. And, and I think that's, that's really a, a baffling thing. It, it, just, it, it just stirs my heart to think that God could love me in that way. Uh, when we think of the, that phrase, I, I used it on purpose, Amazing Grace, the title of that famous hymn. Uh, we, we have to understand, uh, I'm not hijacking that phrase because Newton, who was the author of Amazing Grace, he, um, he claimed to be a Calvinist or a person that believed in predestination or election. And in fact, when he was asked, uh, Do you, are you a Calvinist? He said, yes, I absolutely am. But I, um, I view that belief in election as I would look at sugar. Sugar is a wonderful thing to flavor your tea, but it doesn't mean I want to drink an entire cup of sugar. Uh, 
And, and I think we, we learn from that, that uh, as, and this is a good time to mention that as a warning, as we're talking about the election of God, you know, we can take one part of our theology and make it foundational to everything we want to talk about and believe. And I think that's unwise. Um, our entire faith does not revolve around election. It revolves around Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ and our walk with him. And our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ is flavored by our understanding of God's election of us. But it doesn't replace that, that personal relationship. And, and so when we interact with one another, um, we don't want to turn our doctrine of election into some holy war against people who think differently than us. Because we, we are saved through a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the paramount uh, thing, that the greatest commandment is not to believe in election. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, according to Mark 12.30. So we want to remember that. Now, as we continue on, what, what does Paul say when he explains this concept further that we're chosen by God's kindness? He indicates that if we're chosen by God's grace, then we aren't chosen because of anything we do. And that's important, uh, that we would in, that would include us choosing God. That me, me deciding that God is God is something I would do, and I'm not saved by that. I'm not chosen by that. I'm chosen by God's kindness. It also would include faith, that me believing in God is not a work that I can do, that it brings myself, might brings out my election, um, the act of believing. Since then, God's kindness wouldn't be kindness at all. I think that's important, you know, that, that we're, we're going to talk in a little bit about salvation by merit. Any, anything, any credit we want to take leads to salvation by merit. And I don't want to take away the grace of God. Um, now, some object to this concept by saying faith is not a work, because faith is often contrasted to works in Scripture. I understand that, and I think what I would like to remind us of is context. That in the context of that discussion in Scripture, um, it, it, the, there's a distinction between faith and works in the Bible is about, you know, the belief versus uh, religious activity and, and not a discussion of election. And, and so when, if you're going to grab that scripture that, that contrasts faith and works, that's not about election or the doctrine of election. It's about believing that you're such a goody two-shoes that, that you're a good Christian and, you you know, uh, that it's all about your actions and, and yet it's all really about faith and walking with the Lord. And there are people who maybe don't always have the best works but have a, a belief in Christ. And there might be people who have no belief in Christ that could have better works. And, and it brings us back to you don't earn your salvation. That's the context of that discussion. We're having a different discussion. And, and so we can't just grab verses willy-nilly out of context and, and make argument with it. It's not legitimate. Now, uh, in the context of this passage, what Paul is talking about when he's, when he's discussing election is that he's clearly contrasting God's sovereign choosing of people with any human activity. And, and thus he's pointing to the fact that God's sovereign will is the ultimate basis for God's choice regarding who will come to Christ. And we can't escape that, and I don't think we should want to. So in, as we continue on, we see in Paul's discussion in Ephesians, there's no mention of any foreknowledge of the fact that we would believe. And so this continues. Paul is very consistent in his discussion of grace and election. In all of his letters, he's very consistent. He never contradicts himself. Therefore, since that is scripture, and we accept his inspired word of God, we would be able to say God is very consistent in his belief regarding grace and election, and he never seems to contradict himself. 
Therefore, if we do, we would be wrong. And nor does Paul mention, do we find any mention of anything worthy or meritorious in us, such as the tendency to believe. That is the basis for God's choosing us. And so we can see that. We'll look in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. It says, because of his love, he had already decided to adopt us through Jesus Christ. He freely chose to do this. So that the kindness he had given us in his dear son would be praised and given glory. And so when we look at, um, there's this there's Greek word in, in verse 5, which is pra, pra orizo. And, and what it, indic it indicates that we were predestined. It's the word for predestination that's in here. And what he, Paul is saying is we're predestined to adoption. Thus he already, and that's where God's word puts it, he already decided. Predestined. We were predestined to, to adoption. And, and note again that this predestining and election is connected to God's kindness in this verse, his grace. Here we see consistency, as I mentioned, of Paul's teaching on both grace and election. That it has, the election has nothing to do with our actions, but that it's God's choice as an act of unmerited kindness. Thus, predestination or election precedes our faith, and that's important. Now, this consistency continues on in, in all of Paul's writings. We see it again in 2 Timothy. I'm going to read that verse for us. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. It, it says this, God saved us and called us to be holy, not because of what we had done, but because of his own plan and kindness. Before the world began, God planned that Christ Jesus would show us God's kindness. So we realize we are called to be holy not because of our actions, not, in, not because of anything we have done, but because of God's grace, his kindness. And, and this does relate to our doctrine of election, that we are responding to that call. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called, according to Romans uh, chapter 9. Or excuse me, that's chapter 8, verse 29. Uh and so we see that, and we see that it all connects to God's purposes, his will. Now, in conclusion, I want to make this point. Election based on something good in us, such as our faith, would be the beginning of salvation by merit rather than salvation by grace. And we believe strongly in salvation by grace. And, and this is, for me, this is a recurring concern that I have in a lot of theological discussions and a lot of, of comments I hear people making, people are always needing to have an influential part in their salvation. And I find that disconcerting, that, that what is it about us that always needs to play, even if it's a small part, we have to believe we played a part in our own salvation. You know, I tend to believe that's more a fallen nature thing than a plan of God thing. Man just can't seem to let go and let God make the decisions. That's heartbreaking. Mankind just seems to need to take some quantity of credit for anything that's good. What a shame. Giving it all up to God will lead us to a profound sense of appreciation of God and what he has done for us. We could ask a simple question. What makes people different? Right? I mean, people are exposed to the Lord. Some respond, some don't. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. That's what I come down to. Uh, but what is it that affects the choice, if we can call it that, the choice to follow God? You see, we can never really escape God's hand in it all. Thus, we always come to grace and grace alone. And, and that's one of the five solos of the Reformation, solo gratis. By grace alone are we saved. We are saved by grace alone. Not a combination of grace and the human ability to comprehend and choose wisely, but by grace alone. 
And we are also elected by grace alone because therein is the beginning of it all for us. So the Lord bless you. Amen. And we'll see you next week as we continue this discussion of elections.